I think we're more disconnected than ever before. And I think what I really wanted to make sure we touched upon, which I think will lean into this conversation, is our shadow confronting our shadow so many of us might have heard about shadow work Mm -hmm. some might not some might be really intrigued to know what that is but I want to connect to the shadow so can you first of all explain what our shadow side is for people that don't know and how can we become friends with it sure to make it very simple it's our it shows up as a need of control and it comes from fear so anytime you're trying to control your life to the point that you're losing your inner alignment, which is every 10 minutes, right? A traffic jam, a red light, someone's late, something spills on you. And you're trying to control that, you enter resistance because you're you're not in alignment with the fact that we're in traffic or something bad, quote unquote, happened. That's life. We are operating out of fear of life's unpredictability. So when you get in touch with that, you realize, oh, that is, quote unquote, your shadow. Your shadow comes from deep panic and fear and anxiety. It shows up as image, achievement, perfection, some sort of control. Now, you may control it through humor. I may control it through uh, exercising a lot. Somebody else can control it through pleasing and, uh, you know, being a giver and a and a and a you know somebody who acquiesces to other people mm-hmm. it can show up in different sneaky ways but if you're honest you're like oh i'm trying to control my body right now i'm trying to control my image right now i'm trying to control this relationship right now i'm trying to control how people view me right now and then you go deeper and realize oh man i'm just a basket of nerves and anxiety that's your shadow it shows up in all sorts of sneaky ways it's not always evil. Now, the evil shadow is easy to see. It's the non-evil shadow that is the sneaky, the sneaky one, the snake. And most of us who are not evil, pure evil, think we're amazing. We don't have a shadow because we're not psychopathic murderers. No, we, are, we, are, we also have a shadow. It's just way sneakier. It's just disguised as competence or achievement or, you know, I'm going to, you know, create this company that saves the planet or I'm going to, oh, I've created a new product or I'm starting a new thing or I've written a new book. If you deep down dig into that, quite likely it's because you're motivated by a need for approval, a need for omnipotence, a need to be better than others. And if you're not honest with your sneaky motivation, you're going to act it out, and live in falsity. So every time I write a book, for example, I don't lie to myself that part of it, part of my writing the book is to show people how smart I am. Now that sounds like a really conceited thing to say. No, we are all trying to show how smart we are. I'm just owning it. You understand? Yeah. I'm not you're pretending. saying that's not a bad thing. No, it's a bad thing when you don't own it and right. pretend you're writing books just to help humanity. Mm-hmm. And there's no self-interest. That's a lie, right? Or I'll give you a really simple, basic example. When we women wear obnoxiously high heels and we act like we're doing it because uh, we love ourselves. No, we're uncomfortable. We're insecure. Every time I wear high heels and I'm dreading the, the evening ahead of me, I say to myself, well, you know, this is the price you pay because you were insecure. And so I call it insecurity. I don't pretend like I'm loving being in high heels and uncomfortable all evening like other women want to pretend, right? So I'm in touch with my insecurity and then I have compassion for myself. Oh, you poor little girl, you're so insecure that you need to wear, you know, these stilettos and be uncomfortable and break your ankle and (laughs) misalign your spine. You're really, you know, really you poor thing. And then I love myself through it, you know? Or, or if I'm really hungry for attention and I go get a fabulous outfit, I'm in touch with that insecurity is driving that, not love for myself. See, we women lie to ourselves. We're like, no, I really love myself. So I need to adorn myself and, you know, drip in diamonds. No, it's because you actually loathe yourself that you need to be in diamonds. You understand? And we're not in touch with that deep in us insecurity. It's okay to be insecure. Own it. Don't pretend you're loving yourself by buying a $50,000 diamond. No, it's actually you're so insecure that you need to wear a $50,000 diamond. That's I not love. I wish I could go and get 
dollar diamond, but I can't. But I, I totally no, get No, you don't you need mean. it. You don't need a $50,000 diamond. Yeah. When you're truly in love with yourself and you're complete and whole, you will, you will buy a $5 ring at best or a $20 ring. You know what I'm trying to say. You will not need that. That outer need for validation comes from inner impoverishment. I get what you mean. And I'm not against you buying the damn diamond. Just don't pretend you're doing it out of self-love. You are most likely doing it out of a deep need for external praise and validation. And why do we need external praise and validation? Because we're not whole and complete within ourselves. Right? Mm -hmm. What do you ask yourselves in those times, though, when you... I mean, obviously now you've got to the point where you can see it very clearly, but for people that can't, do you have any like helpful check-ins that people can do? Well, it's about being honest, right? Why am I buying this? Why am I eating this? Why am I drinking my seventh glass of wine? Why am I going overboard to be loving to this person who's not being attentive to me? Mm. You have to really That's look at- That's the harder one. That's the harder one, the external validation of someone else. Yeah, you have to you have to really be honest with yourself and not fake disguise it as love. You have to go, is this really love? Do I really love this person or do I really like them loving me? And and most of us if we're very honest, we'd be like I really like the attention I get. I really like that he's my partner or she's my partner. This is a little bit of a trophy here. I want the attention. And we women especially are confused about our real motivations, you know, and, and, and I may be stereotypical here, but males, if they're honest and they are more honest, I think they'll say, I just wanted to go to bed with her. You know, I just wanted to sleep with her. And then we are so appalled at their brutal honesty. Oh, you used me. But were we really checking in with ourselves? Were we really sure of ourselves or were we trying to get them to love us, to like us more? So we had an agenda too. Our agenda just seems more noble, but it's an agenda and an agenda is an agenda, period. Mm. I do think it's harder for women in that landscape though, because there's so much more societal pressure on a woman than there is in a man. And it really, really gets to me. But, how... but here's the thing, my love. Mm. How are we co-creating our own self-pressure, right? At the mm -hmm. end of the day, who is forcing me to sleep with someone? Who is forcing Not me to- Not that bit, the bigger picture. Yeah, but we are, we are, we have to, if we want individual liberation, we have to do it for ourselves and then fight the bigger fight out there. But before we fight a bigger fight out there, we must resolve the fight within ourselves. So at the end of the day, it's me in the mirror, me in the bed alone. How am I with myself? Nobody's forcing me to buy the diamond. Nobody's forcing me to get bigger boobs. Nobody's forcing me to wear the stilettos. Nobody's forcing me to get married or have children. I am also a co-subscriber of society's subscriptions. I'm also buying into the prescription. And if I don't own that part in me, right? I'm asking each one of us to own that part that buys into the bullshit. You can't blame the bullshit. You have to own your part, however small. Listen, the oppressor will never release the oppressed because the oppressor is winning. It is the task and the mandate of the oppressed to fight for each other, to rise in solidarity, to be in sisterhood, not competition like we women are, and to rise up and to rise up. But we have to first be in sisterhood with ourselves. We have to be our greatest self-advocates. Don't expect the oppressors to come rescuing us. They're not going to do it. And it's not their job. No. So it's our self-empowerment that is the first place we begin. And self-empowerment can only begin with brutal self-accountability and owning the co-creation. And sure, we women have a lot to complain about. But hey, I can tell you 10,000 ways that we've co-created this reality as well. Can I ask now for you, for yourself, for everything you've gone through, I know that you wrote the book, Radical Awakening, Through a Divorce. Um, and I know you've been through a lot of your own kind of check-in, self-awareness, conscious living. Can I ask now what you feel is right for you through all the work that you've done and everything that you've personally learned in your journey? Like what 
So take out all the society and what you th- what you thought you had to do. What do you now feel is right for you and how you should be living? I think it's about me, moment by moment, striving for more inner alignment. So I call myself more and more on my bullshit and have compassion for it. And then I try to steer myself away from the falsity and try to just live within the circle of truth more and more. And I'm not yet in this pure place by any means, but I know where I'm in the bullshit place. I know it. I can see it. And I allow myself, you know, I may say to myself, okay, you suppose I'm like going to meet, say, Oprah, okay, somebody who I adore. And I and I watch myself trying to get a cute outfit or the best earrings. And I'm giving a simple example because it's in the simple that the profound is discovered, right? I'll catch myself, like, look at you. You want to look cute. You want to look, and then I'll have compassion for it. And then I'll steady myself in the balance and not just lose myself in the in the orbit of external validation. So I do that in all my relationships and try to enter my heart more and more and move away from people, places, and things that make me guarded from my heart, right? I want to be in my heart, but that means I have to be in my mind to protect my heart. So first, I have to use discernment and my mind and use my defenses of protection and boundaries to create a safe haven for my heart before I used to just be in my heart and I never activated discernment and wisdom. Other people have to do it the opposite way. They're in their mind too much, they have to be in their heart more. So for heart-driven people, they have to activate the mind more and use discernment and boundaries. So I'm I'm learning the balance of that. But now I'm I'm becoming better at activating my heart, but in the safe containment of a very discern, discerning, wise mind. So this is a lot of inner work and uh, self-activation. And that's my path. So as long as I do it every day, I'm not going to abandon myself too much. I will a little bit, but not. I'll catch myself way faster. And the next thing I do for myself is really play with life. Like I'm here to to love you and to discover this moment and to enjoy this moment and then to have compassion, no judgment. And I'll move on from here and I'll try to not have judgment about it. So when I live like that, I live, you know, in a delicious uh, connection with life. I find life delectable, pleasurable, fun, joyful, joyful, abundant, because I'm here to play with it. I'm not here to get something from it, you see. I'm not here to capitalize to win, to dominate. I'm just here to play with it, to discover who I am, to discover who you are, to have a connection, heart-based connection, and then to move the F on, right? So that allows me to be free and to evolve constantly. Mm -hmm. I resonate with that so much because a friend sent me a video yesterday from Joe Dispenza and it was about focusing on not the negative stories within your life, which so many of us can do. And I have definitely done recently more than ever before um but actually in the last few weeks i've taken a huge turn in that and actually started focusing my energy on the abundance and the gratitude which can be really difficult um but actually when we do that we we attract more of that in our lives and there's so much to be said about not focusing on the negative things which i think our mind can naturally go to so i don't want want anyone to think you know that they're broken in that sense because we're kind of neurowired to try and protect ourselves. But actually, as you said, when we can catch ourselves and bring ourselves back to like what's happening, what's the future, what have we got in our life and where can we have compassion, we actually create so much more abundance, I think, yes. in our lives and possibilities. Absolutely. And it's not about bypassing the pain of being a human, but understanding in that pain, when you sit with it, that a lot of that pain is coming from our false ideas of what should be and grieving the loss of the what should have been is a human experience. It's okay to cry when a love dies or a relationship ends or a person physically dies. That's a human experience. But in that, to just drip in the wisdom that all of life is impermanent. So 
part of grieving that is to be in resistance to the wisdom that this is inevitable. All relationships will end in the physical or in the metaphysical. So grieving that is human and we should not bypass that. But thinking it's negative is a story. It's not positive either. It just is. It just is the human experience. It's messy as F. And if you can just embrace the messiness and let go the need for it to be perfect, you'll actually live the most abundant, expansive life. <laughs>